Chapter Two, Section Eleven of the Greek View of Life by Goldsworthy Lowes Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Chapter Two, Section Eleven sceptical criticism of the basis of the state having thus supplemented our general account of the greek conception of the state by a description of their two most prominent polities it remains for us in conclusion briefly to trace the negative criticism under whose attack that conception threatened to dissolve we have quoted in an earlier part of this chapter a striking passage from demosthenes embodying that view of the objective validity of law under which alone political institutions can be secure that is law said the orator which all men ought to obey for many reasons and especially because every law is an invention and gift of the gods a resolution of wise men a corrective of errors intentional and unintentional a compact of the whole state according to which all who belong to the state ought to live that is the conception of law which the citizens of any stable state must be prepared substantially to accept for it is the condition of that fundamental belief in established institutions which alone can make it worth while to adapt and to improve them it was accordingly the conception tacitly at least accepted in greece during the period of her constructive vigour but it is a conception constantly open to attack for law at any given moment even under the most favourable conditions cannot do more than approximate to its own ideal it is at best but a rough attempt at that reconciliation of conflicting interests towards which the reason of mankind is always seeking and even in well-ordered states there must always be individuals and classes who resent and rightly resent it as unjust but the greek states as we have seen were not well ordered on the contrary they were always on the verge or in the act of civil war and the conception of law as a compact of the whole state according to which all who belong to the state ought to live must have been at the least severely tried in cities permanently divided into two factions each intent not merely on defeating the other but on excluding it altogether from political rights such conditions in fact must have irresistibly suggested the criticism which always dogs the idea of the state and against which its only defence is in a perpetual perfection of itself the criticism that law after all is only the rule of the strong and justice the name under which they close their usurpation that is a point of view which even apart from their political dissensions would hardly have escaped the subtle intellect of the greeks and in fact from the close of the fifth century onwards we find it constantly canvassed and discussed the mind of plato in particular was exercised by this contention and it was one may say a main object of his teaching to rescue the idea of justice 
from identification with the special interest of the strong and reaffirm it as the general interest of all for this end he takes occasion to state with the utmost frankness and lucidity the view which it is his intention to refute and consequently it is in his works that we find the fullest exposition of the destructive argument he seeks to answer briefly that argument runs as follows it is the law of nature that the strong shall rule a law which every one recognizes in fact though every one repudiates it in theory government therefore simply means the rule of the strong and exists no matter what its form whether tyranny oligarchy or democracy in the interests not of its subjects but of itself justice and law are the specious names it employs to cloak its own arbitrary will they have no objective validity no reference to the well-being of all and it is only the weak and the foolish on whom they impose strong and original natures sweep away this tangle of words assert themselves in defiance of false shame and claim the right divine that is theirs by nature to rule at their will by virtue of their strength each government says thrasymachus in the republic has its laws framed to suit its own interests a democracy making democratic laws an autocrat despotic laws and so on now by this procedure these governments have pronounced that what is for the interests of themselves is just for their subjects and whoever deviates from this is chastised by them as guilty of illegality and injustice therefore my good sir my meaning is that in all cities the same thing namely the interest of the established government is just and superior strength i presume is to be found on the side of government so that the conclusion of right reasoning is that the same thing namely the interest of the stronger is everywhere just here is an argument which strikes at the root of all subordination to the state setting the subject against the ruler the minority against the majority with an emphasis of opposition that admits of no conceivable reconciliation and as we have noticed it was an argument to which the actual political conditions of greece gave a strong show of plausibility how then did the constructive thinkers of greece attempt to meet it the procedure adopted by plato is curiously opposed to that which might seem natural to a modern thinker on politics the scepticism which was to be met having sprung from the extremity of class antagonism it might be supposed that the cure would be sought in some sort of system of equality plato's idea is precisely the contrary the distinction between classes he exaggerates to its highest point only he would have it depend on degrees not of wealth but of excellence in the ideal republic which he constructs as a type of a state where justice should really rule he sets an impassable gulf between the governing class and the governed each is specially trained and specially bred for its appropriate function and the harmony between them is ensured by the recognition on either part 
that each is in occupation of the place for which it is naturally fitted in that whole to which both alike are subordinate such a state no doubt if ever it had been realized in practice would have been a complete reply to the sceptical argument for it would have established a justice which was the expression not of the caprice of the governing class but of the objective will of the whole community but in practice such a state was not realized in greece and the experience of the greek world does not lead us to suppose that it was capable of realization the system of stereotyping classes in a word of caste which has played so great a part in the history of the world does no doubt embody a great truth that of natural inequality and this truth as we saw was at the bottom of that greek conception of the state of which the republic of plato is an idealizing caricature but the problem is to make the inequality of nature really correspond to the inequality imposed by institutions this problem plato hoped to solve by a strict public control of the marriage relation so that none should be born into any class who were not naturally fitted to be members of it but as a matter of fact the difficulty has never been met and the system of caste remains open to the reproach that its justice is conventional and arbitrary not the expression of the objective nature and will of all classes and members of the community the attempt of aristotle to construct a state that should be the embodiment of justice is similar to plato's so far as the relation of classes is concerned he too postulates a governing class of soldiers and councillors and a subject class of productive labourers when however he turns from the ideal to practical politics and considers merely how to avoid the worst extremes of party antagonism his solution is the simple and familiar one of the preponderance of the middle class the same view was dominant both in french and english politics from the year eighteen thirty onwards and is only now being thrust aside by the democratic ideal in greece it was never realized except as a passing phase in the perpetual flux of polities and in fine it may be said that the problem of establishing a state which should be a concrete refutation of the sceptical criticism that justice is merely another name for force was one that was never solved in ancient greece the dissolution of the idea of the state was more a symptom than a cause of its failure in practice to harmonize its warring elements and greece divided into conflicting polities each of which again was divided within itself passed on to macedon and thence to rome that task of reconciling the individual and the class with the whole about which the political history of the world turns end of chapter two section eleven recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey to two section twelve of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Martin Giessen. Chapter Two, Section Twelve. Summary. We have now given some account of the general character of the Greek state, the ideas that underlay it, and the criticism of those ideas suggested by the course of history and formulated by speculative thought. It remains to offer certain reflections on the political achievement of the Greeks and its relation to our own ideas the fruitful and positive aspect of the greek state that which fastens it upon the eyes of later generations as upon a model if not to be copied at least to be praised and admired is that identification of the individual citizen with the corporate life which delivered him from the narrow circle of personal interests into a sphere of wider views and higher aims the greek citizen as we have seen in the best days of the best states in athens for example in the age of pericles was at once a soldier and a politician body and mind alike were at his country's service and his whole ideal of conduct was inextricably bound up with his intimate and personal participation in public affairs if now with this ideal we contrast the life of an average citizen in a modern state the absorption in private business and family concerns the greasy domesticity to use a phrase of byron's that limits and clouds his vision of the world we may well feel that the greeks had achieved something which we have lost and may even desire to return so far as we may upon our steps and to re-establish that interpenetration of private and public life by which the individual citizen was at once depressed and glorified it may be doubted however whether such a procedure would be in any way possible or desirable for in the first place the existence of the greek citizen depended upon that of an inferior class who were regarded not as ends in themselves but as means to his perfection and that is an arrangement which runs directly counter to the modern ideal all modern societies aim to this extent at least at equality that their tendency so far as it is conscious and avowed is not to separate off a privileged class of citizens set free by the labour of others to live the perfect life but rather to distribute impartially to all the burdens and advantages of the state so that every one shall be at once a labourer for himself and a citizen of the state but this ideal is clearly incompatible with the greek conception of the citizen it implies that the greater portion of every man's life must be devoted to some kind of mechanical labour whose immediate connection with the public good though certain is remote and obscure and that in consequence a deliberate and unceasing preoccupation with the end of the state becomes as a general rule impossible and in the second place the mere complexity and size of a modern state is against the identification of the man with the citizen for on the one hand public issues are so large and so involved that it is only a few who can hope to have any adequate comprehension of them and on the other the subdivision of functions is so minute that even when a man is directly employed in the service of the state 
his activity is confined to some highly specialised department he must choose for example whether he will be a clerk in the treasury or a soldier but he cannot certainly be both in the greek state any citizen could undertake simultaneously or in succession and with complete comprehension and mastery every one of the comparatively few and simple public offices in a modern state such an arrangement has become impossible the mere mechanical and physical conditions of our life preclude the ideal of the ancient citizen but it may be said the activity of the citizen of a modern state should be and increasingly will be concerned not with the whole but with the part by the development of local institutions he will come more and more to identify himself with the public life of his district and his town and will bear to that much the same relation as was borne by the ancient greek to his city-state certainly so far as the limitation of area and the simplicity and intelligibility of issues is concerned such an analogy might be fairly pressed and it is probably in connection with such local areas that the average citizen does and increasingly will become aware of his corporate relations but on the other hand it can hardly be maintained that public business in this restricted sense either could or should play the part in the life of the modern man that it played in that of the ancient greek for local business after all is a matter of sewers and parks and however great the importance of such matters may be and however great their claim upon the attention of competent men yet the kind of interest they awaken and the kind of faculties they employ can hardly be such as to lead to the identification of the individual ideal with that of public activity the life of the greek citizen involved an exercise the finest and most complete of all his powers of body soul and mind the same can hardly be said of the life of a county councillor even of the best and most conscientious of them and the conclusion appears to be that that fusion of public and private life which was involved in the ideal of the greek citizen was a passing phase in the history of the world that the state can never occupy again the place in relation to the individual which it held in the cities of the ancient world and that an attempt to identify in a modern state the ideal of the man with that of the citizen would be an historical anachronism nor is this a conclusion which need be regretted for as the sphere of the state shrinks it is possible that that of the individual may be enlarged the public side of human life it may be supposed will become more and more mechanical as our understanding and control of social forces grow but every reduction to habit and rule of what were once spiritual functions implies the liberation of the higher powers for a possible activity in other regions and if advantage were taken of this opportunity the inestimable compensation for the contraction to routine of the life of the citizen would be the expansion into new spheres of speculation and passion of the freer and more individual life of the man end of chapter two the greek view of the state
Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Section One of the Greek View of Life by Goldsworthy Lowes Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Chapter Three the greek view of the individual section one the greek view of manual labour and trade in our discussion of the greek view of the state we noticed the tendency both of the theory and the practice of the greeks to separate the citizens proper from the rest of the community as a distinct and aristocratic class and this tendency we had occasion to observe was partly to be attributed to the high conception which the greeks had formed of the proper excellence of man an excellence which it was the function of the citizen to realize in his own person at the cost if need be of the other members of the state this greek conception of the proper excellence of man it is now our purpose to examine more closely the chief point that strikes us about the greek ideal is its comprehensiveness our own word virtue is applied only to moral qualities but the greek word which we so translate should properly be rendered excellence and includes a reference to the body as well as to the soul a beautiful soul housed in a beautiful body and supplied with all the external advantages necessary to produce and perpetuate such a combination that is the greek conception of well-being and it is because labour with the hands or at the desk distorts or impairs the body and the petty cares of a calling pursued for bread pervert the soul that so strong a contempt was felt by the greeks for manual labour and trade the arts that are called mechanical says xenophon are also and naturally enough held in bad repute in our cities for they spoil the bodies of workers and superintendents alike compelling them to live sedentary indoor lives and in some cases even to pass their days by the fire and as their bodies become effeminate so do their souls also grow less robust besides this in such trades one has no leisure to devote to the care of one's friends or of one's city so that those who engage in them are thought to be bad backers of their friends and bad defenders of their country in a similar spirit plato asserts that a life of drudgery disfigures the body and mars and enervates the soul while aristotle defines a mechanical trade as one which renders the body and soul or intellect of free persons unfit for the exercise and practice of virtue and denies to the artisan not merely the proper excellence of man but any excellence of any kind on the plea that his occupation and status is unnatural and that he misses even that reflex of human virtue which a slave derives from his intimate connection with his master if then the artisan was excluded from the citizenship in some of the greek states and even in the most democratic of them never altogether threw off the stigma of inferiority attaching to his trade the reason was that the life he was compelled to lead 
was incompatible with the greek conception of excellence that conception we will now proceed to examine a little more in detail end of chapter three section one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section two of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson chapter three section two appreciation of external goods in the first place the greek ideal required for its realization a solid basis of external goods it recognized frankly the dependence of man upon the world of sense and the contribution to his happiness of elements over which he had at best but a partial control not that it placed his good outside himself in riches power and other such appendages but that it postulated certain gifts of fortune as necessary means to his self-development of these the chief were a competence to secure him against sordid cares health to ensure his physical excellence and children to support and protect him in old age aristotle's definition of the happy man is one whose activity accords with perfect virtue and who is adequately furnished with external goods not for a casual period of time but for a complete or perfect lifetime and he remarks somewhat caustically that those who say that a man on the rack would be happy if only he were good intentionally or unintentionally are talking nonsense that here as elsewhere aristotle represents the common greek view we have abundant testimony from other sources even plato in whom there runs so clear a vein of asceticism follows the popular judgment in reckoning high among goods first health then beauty then skill and strength in physical exercises and lastly wealth if it be not blind but illumined by the eye of reason to these goods must be added to complete the scale success and reputation topics which are the constant theme of the poet's eulogy two things alone there are says pindar that cherish life's bloom to its utmost sweetness amid the fair flowers of wealth to have good success and to win therefore fair fame and the passage represents his habitual attitude that the gifts of fortune both personal and external are an essential condition of excellence is an axiom of the point of view of the greeks but on the other hand we never find them misled into the conception that such gifts are an end in themselves apart from the personal qualities they are meant to support or adorn the oriental ideal of unlimited wealth and power enjoyed merely for its own sake never appealed to their fine and lucid judgment nothing could better illustrate this point than the anecdote related by herodotus of the interview between solon and croesus king of lydia croesus proud of his boundless wealth asks the greek stranger who is the happiest man on earth expecting to hear in reply his own name 
solon however answers with the name of tellus the athenian giving his reasons in the following speech first because his country was flourishing in his days and he himself had sons both beautiful and good and he lived to see children born to each of them and these children all grew up and further because after a life spent in what our people look upon as comfort his end was surpassingly glorious in a battle between the athenians and their neighbours near eleusis he came to the assistance of his countrymen routed the foe and died upon the field most gallantly the athenians gave him a public funeral on the spot where he fell and paid him the highest honours later on in the discussion solon defines the happy man as he who is whole of limb a stranger to disease free from misfortune happy in his children and comely to look upon and who also ends his life well end of chapter three section two recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section three of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson chapter three section three appreciation of physical qualities while however the gifts of a happy fortune are an essential condition of the greek ideal they are not to be mistaken for the ideal itself a beautiful soul in a beautiful body to recur to our former phrase is the real end and aim of their endeavour beautiful and good is their habitual way of describing what we should call a gentleman and no expression could better represent what they admired with ourselves in spite of our addiction to athletics the body takes a secondary place after a certain age at least there are few men who make its systematic cultivation an important factor of their life and in our estimate of merit physical qualities are accorded either none or the very smallest weight it was otherwise with the greeks to them a good body was the necessary correlative of a good soul balance was what they aimed at balance and harmony and they could scarcely believe in the beauty of the spirit unless it were reflected in the beauty of the flesh the point is well put by plato the most spiritually minded of the greeks and the least apt to underprize the qualities of the soul surely then he says to him who has an eye to see there can be no fairer spectacle than that of a man who combines the possession of moral beauty in his soul with outward beauty of form corresponding and harmonizing with the former because the same great pattern enters into both there can be none so fair and you will grant that what is fairest is loveliest undoubtedly it is then the truly musical person will love those who combine most perfectly moral and physical beauty but will not love any one in whom there is dissonance 
no not if there be any defect in the soul but if it is only a bodily blemish he may so bear with it as to be willing to regard it with complacency i understand that you have now or have had a favourite of this kind so i give way the reluctance of the admission that a physical defect may possibly be overlooked is as significant as the rest of the passage body and soul it is clear are regarded as aspects of a single whole so that a blemish in the one indicates and involves a blemish in the other the training of the body is thus in a sense the training of the soul and gymnastic and music as plato puts it serve the same end the production of a harmonious temperament end of chapter 3 section 3 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Three, section four of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson chapter three section four greek athletics it is this conception which gives or appears at least in the retrospect to give a character so gracious and fine to greek athletics in fact if we look more closely into the character of the public games in greece we see that they were so surrounded and transfused by an atmosphere of imagination that their appeal must have been as much to the aesthetic as to the physical sense for in the first place those great gymnastic contests in which all hellas took part and which gave the tone to their whole athletic life were primarily religious festivals the olympic and nemean games were held in honour of zeus the pythian of apollo the isthmian of poseidon in the enclosures in which they took place stood temples of the gods and sacrifice prayer and choral hymn were the background against which they were set and since in greece religion implied art in the wake of the athlete followed the sculptor and the poet the colossal zeus of phidias the wonder of the ancient world flashed from the precincts of olympia its glory of ivory and gold temples and statues broke the brilliant light into colour and form and under that vibrating heaven of beauty the loveliest nature crowned with the finest art shifted and shone what was in itself a perfect type of both the grace of harmonious motion in naked youths and men for in greek athletics by virtue of the practice of contending nude the contest itself became a work of art and not only did sculptors draw from it an inspiration such as has been felt by no later age but to the combatants themselves and the spectators the plastic beauty of the human form grew to be more than its prowess or its strength and gymnastic became a training in aesthetics as much as or more than in physical excellence and as with the contest so with the reward everything was designed to appeal to the sensuous imagination 
the prize formerly adjudged was symbolical only a crown of olive but the real triumph of the victor was the ode in which his praise was sung the procession of happy comrades and the evening festival when as pindar has it the lovely shining of the fair-faced moon beamed forth and all the precinct sounded with songs of festal glee or beside castali in the evening his name burnt bright when the glad sounds of the graces rose of the graces for these were the powers who presided over the world of greek athletics here for example is the opening of one of pindar's odes typical of the spirit in which he at least conceived the functions of the chronicler of sport o ye who haunt the land of goodly steeds that drinketh of kephaisos waters lusty orchomenos queens renowned in song o graces guardians of the minii's ancient race hearken for unto you i pray for by your gift come unto men all pleasant things and sweet and the wisdom of a man and his beauty and the splendour of his fame yea even gods without the graces aid rule never at feast or dance but these have charge of all things done in heaven and beside pythian apollo of the golden bow they have set their thrones and worship the eternal majesty of the olympian father o lady aglaia and thou euphrosyne lover of song children of the mightiest of the gods listen and hear and thou thalia delighting in sweet sounds and look down upon this triumphal company moving with light step under happy fate in lydian mood of melody concerning asopichos am i come hither to sing for that through thee aglaia in the olympic games the minii's home is winner this is but a single passage among many that might be quoted to illustrate the point we are endeavouring to bring into relief the conscious predominance in the greek games of that element of poetry and art which is either not present at all in modern sport or at best is a happy accessory of chance the modern man and especially the englishman addicts himself to athletics as to other avocations with a certain stolidity of gaze on the immediate end which tends to confine him to the purely physical view of his pursuit the greek an artist by nature lifted his not less strenuous sports into an air of finer sentiment touched them with the poetry of legend and the grace of art and song and even to his most brutal contests for brutal some of them were imparted so rich an atmosphere of beauty that they could be admitted as fit themes for dedication to the graces by the choice and spiritual genius of pindar End of chapter three section four recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section five of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Martin Giessen. Chapter Three, Section Five. Greek Ethics identification of the aesthetic and ethical points of view and as with the excellence of the body so with that of the soul the conception that dominated the mind of the greeks was primarily aesthetic in speaking of their religion we have already remarked that they had no sense of sin and we may now add that they had no sense of duty moral virtue they conceived not as obedience to an external law a sacrifice of the natural man to a power that in a sense is alien to himself but rather as the tempering into due proportion of the elements of which human nature is composed the good man was the man who was beautiful beautiful in soul virtue says plato will be a kind of health and beauty and good habit of the soul and vice will be a disease and deformity and sickness of it it follows that it is as natural to seek virtue and to avoid vice as to seek health and to avoid disease there is no question of a struggle between opposite principles the distinction of good and evil is one of order or confusion among elements which in themselves are neither good nor bad this conception of virtue we find expressed in many forms but always with the same underlying idea a favourite watchword with the greeks is the middle or mean the exact point of rightness between two extremes nothing in excess was a motto inscribed over the temple of delphi and none could be more characteristic of the ideal of these lovers of proportion aristotle indeed has made it the basis of his whole theory of ethics in his conception virtue is the mean vice the excess lying on either side courage for example the mean between foolhardiness and cowardice temperance between incontinence and insensibility generosity between extravagance and meanness the various phases of feeling and the various kinds of action he analyses minutely on this principle understanding always by the mean that which adapts itself in the due proportion to the circumstances and requirements of every case the interest of this view for us lies in its assumption that it is not passions or desires in themselves that must be regarded as bad but only their disproportional or misdirected indulgence let us take for example the case of the pleasures of sense the puritan's rule is to abjure them altogether to him they are absolutely wrong in themselves apart from all considerations of time and place aristotle on the contrary enjoins not renunciation but temperance and defines the temperate man as one who holds a mean position in respect of pleasures he takes no pleasure in the things in which the licentious man takes most pleasure he rather dislikes them nor does he take pleasure at all in wrong things nor an excessive pleasure in anything that is pleasant nor is he pained at the absence of such things nor does he desire them except perhaps in moderation nor does he desire them more than is right or at the wrong time 
and so on but he will be eager in a moderate and right spirit for all such things as are pleasant and at the same time conducive to health or to a sound bodily condition and for all other pleasures so long as they are not prejudicial to these or inconsistent with noble conduct or extravagant beyond his means for unless a person limits himself in this way he affects such pleasures more than is right whereas the temperate man follows the guidance of right reason as another illustration of this point of view we may take the case of anger the christian rule is never to resent an injury but rather in the new testament phrase to turn the other cheek aristotle while blaming the man who is unduly passionate blames equally the man who is insensitive the thing to aim at is to be angry on the proper occasions and with the proper people in the proper manner and for the proper length of time and in this and all other cases the definition of what is proper must be left to the determination of the sensible man thus in place of a series of hard and fast rules a rigid and uncompromising distinction of acts and affections into good and bad the former to be absolutely chosen and the latter absolutely eschewed aristotle presents us with the general type of a subtle and shifting problem the solution of which must be worked out afresh by each individual in each particular case conduct to him is a free and living creature and not a machine controlled by fixed laws every life is a work of art shaped by the man who lives it according to the faculty of the artist will be the quality of his work and no general rules can supply the place of his own direct perception at every turn the good is the right proportion the right manner and occasion the bad is all that varies from this right but the elements of human nature in themselves are neither good nor bad they are merely the raw material out of which the one or the other may be shaped the idea thus formulated by aristotle is typically greek in another form it is the basis of the ethical philosophy of plato who habitually regards virtue as a kind of order the virtue of each thing he says whether body or soul instrument or creature when given to them in the best way comes to them not by chance but as the result of the order and truth and art which are imparted to them and the conception here indicated is worked out in detail in his republic there after distinguishing in the soul three principles or powers reason passion and desire he defines justice as the maintenance among them of their proper mutual relation each moving in its own place and doing its appropriate work as is or should be the case with the different classes in a state the just man will not permit the several principles within him to do any work but their own nor allow the distinct classes in his soul to interfere with each other but will really set his house in order and having gained the mastery over himself will so regulate his own character as to be on good terms with himself and to set those three principles in tune together 
as if they were verily three chords of a harmony a higher and a lower and a middle and whatever may lie between these and after he has bound all these together and reduced the many elements of his nature to a real unity as a temperate and duly harmonized man he will then at length proceed to do whatever he may have to do plato it is true in other parts of his work approaches more closely to the dualistic conception of an absolute opposition between good and bad principles in man yet even so he never altogether abandons that aesthetic point of view which looks to the establishment of order among the conflicting principles rather than to the annihilation of one by the other in an internecine conflict the point may be illustrated by the following passage where the two horses represent respectively the elements of fleshly desire and spiritual passion while the charioteer stands for the controlling reason and where it will be noticed the ultimate harmony is achieved not by the complete eradication of desire but by its due subordination to the higher principle even plato the most ascetic of the greeks is a greek first and an ascetic afterwards of the nature of the soul though her true form be ever a theme of large and more than mortal discourse let me speak briefly and in a figure and let the figure be composite a pair of winged horses and a charioteer now the winged horses and the charioteers of the gods are all of them noble and of noble descent but those of other races are mixed the human charioteer drives his in a pair and one of them is noble and of noble breed and the other is ignoble and of ignoble breed and the driving of them of necessity gives a great deal of trouble to him the right-hand horse is upright and cleanly made he has a lofty neck and an aquiline nose his colour is white and his eyes dark he is a lover of honour and modesty and temperance and the follower of true glory he needs no touch of the whip but is guided by word and admonition only the other is a crooked lumbering animal put together anyhow he has a short thick neck he is flat-faced and of a dark colour with grey eyes and blood-red complexion the mate of insolence and pride shag-eared and deaf hardly yielding to whip and spur now when the charioteer beholds the vision of love and has his whole soul warmed through sense and is full of the prickings and ticklings of desire the obedient steed then as always under the government of shame refrains from leaping on the beloved but the other heedless of the blows of the whip plunges and runs away giving all manner of trouble to his companion and the charioteer whom he forces to approach the beloved and to remember the joys of love they at first indignantly oppose him and will not be urged on to do terrible and unlawful deeds but at last when he persists in plaguing them they yield and agree to do as he bids them and now they are at the spot and behold the flashing beauty of the beloved 
which when the charioteer sees his memory is carried to the true beauty whom he beholds in company with modesty like an image placed upon a holy pedestal he sees her but he is afraid and falls backwards in adoration and by his fall is compelled to pull back the reins with such violence as to bring both the steeds on their haunches the one willing and unresisting the unruly one very unwilling and when they have gone back a little the one is overcome with shame and wonder and his whole soul is bathed in perspiration the other when the pain is over which the bridle and the fall had given him having with difficulty taken breath is full of wrath and reproaches which he heaps upon the charioteer and his fellow steed for want of courage and manhood declaring that they have been false to their agreement and guilty of desertion again they refuse and again he urges them on and will scarce yield to their prayer that he would wait until another time when the appointed hour comes they make as if they had forgotten and he reminds them fighting and neighing and dragging them on until at length he on the same thoughts intent forces them to draw near again and when they are near he stoops his head and puts up his tail and takes the bit in his teeth and pulls shamelessly then the charioteer is worse off than ever he falls back like a racer at the barrier and with a still more violent wrench drags the bit out of the teeth of the wild steed and covers his abusive jaws and tongue with blood and forces his legs and haunches to the ground and punishes him sorely and when this has happened several times and the villain has ceased from his wanton way he is tamed and humbled and follows the will of the charioteer and when he sees the beautiful one he is ready to die of fear and from that time forward the soul of the lover follows the beloved in modesty and holy fear even from this passage in spite of its dualistic hypothesis but far more clearly from the whole tenor of his work we may perceive that plato's description of virtue as an order of the soul is prompted by the same conception characteristically greek as aristotle's account of virtue as a mean the view as we said at the beginning is properly aesthetic rather than moral it regards life less as a battle between two contending principles in which victory means the annihilation of the one the altogether bad by the other the altogether good than as the maintenance of a balance between elements neutral in themselves but capable according as their relations are rightly ordered or the reverse of producing either that harmony which is called virtue or that discord which is called vice such being the conception of virtue characteristic of the greeks it follows that the motive to pursue it can hardly have presented itself to them in the form of what we call the sense of duty for duty emphasizes self-repression against the desires of man it sets a law of prohibition a law which is not conceived as that of his own complete nature 
asserting against a partial or disproportioned development the balance and totality of the ideal but rather as a rule imposed from without by a power distinct from himself for the mortification not the perfecting of his natural impulses and aims duty emphasizes self-repression the greek view emphasized self-development that health and beauty and good habit of the soul which is plato's ideal is as much its own recommendation to the natural man as is the health and beauty of the body vice on this view is condemned because it is a frustration of nature virtue praised because it is her fulfilment and the motive throughout is simply that passion to realize oneself which is commonly acknowledged as sufficient in the case of physical development and which appeared sufficient to the greeks in the case of the development of the soul end of chapter 3 section 5 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey section six of the greek view of life by goldsworthy lowes dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by martin geeson chapter three section six the greek view of pleasure from all this it follows clearly enough that the greek ideal was far removed from asceticism but it might perhaps be supposed on the other hand that it came dangerously near to license nothing however could be further from the case that there were libertines among the greeks as everywhere else goes without saying but the conception that the greek rule of life was to follow impulse and abandon restraint is a figment of would-be hellenists of our own time the word which best sums up the ideal of the greeks is temperance the mean order harmony as we saw are its characteristic expressions and the self-realization to which they aspired was not an anarchy of passion but an ordered evolution of the natural faculties under the strict control of a balanced mind the point may be illustrated by a reference to the treatment of pleasure in the philosophy of plato and of aristotle the practice of the libertine is to identify pleasure and good in such a manner that he pursues at any moment any pleasure that presents itself eschewing comparison and reflection with all that might tend to check that continuous flow of vivid and fresh sensations which he postulates as the end of life the ideal of the greeks on the contrary as interpreted by their two greatest thinkers while on the one hand it is so far opposed to asceticism that it requires pleasure as an essential complement of good on the other is so far from identifying the two that it recognizes an ordered scale of pleasures and while rejecting altogether those at the lower end admits the rest not as in themselves constituting the good but rather as harmless additions or at most as necessary accompaniments of its operation plato in the republic distinguishes between the necessary and unnecessary pleasures defining the former as those derived from the gratification of appetites 
which we cannot get rid of and whose satisfaction does us good such for example as the appetite for wholesome food and the latter as those which belong to appetites which we can put away from us by early training and the presence of which besides never does us any good and in some cases does positive harm such for example as the appetite for delicate and luxurious dishes the former he would admit the latter he excludes from his ideal of happiness and though in a later dialogue the philebus he goes further than this and would exclude from the perfect life all pleasures except those which he describes as pure that is those which attend upon the contemplation of form and colour and sound or which accompany intellectual activity yet here no doubt he is passing beyond the sphere of the practicable ideal and his distinct personal bias towards asceticism must be discounted if we are to take him as representative of the greek view his general contention however that pleasures must be ranked as higher and as lower and that at the best they are not to be identified with the good is fully accepted by so typical a greek as aristotle aristotle however is careful not to condemn any pleasure that is not definitely harmful even unnecessary pleasures he admits may be desirable in themselves even the deliberate creation of desire with a view to the enjoyment of satisfying it may be admissible if it is not injurious still there are kinds of pleasures which ought not to be pursued and occasions and methods of seeking it which are improper and perverse therefore the reason must always be at hand to check and to control and the ultimate test of true worth in pleasure as in everything else is the trained judgment of the good and sensible man end of chapter three section six Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. Section 7 of The Greek View of Life by Goldsworthy Lowes Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Chapter 3, Section 7 illustrations ischomachus socrates such then was the character of the greek conception of excellence the account we have given may seem somewhat abstract and ideal but it gives the general formula of the life which every cultivated greek would at any rate have wished to live and in confirmation of this point we may adduce the testimony of xenophon who has left us a description evidently drawn from life of what he conceives to be the perfect type of a gentleman the interest of the account lies in the fact that xenophon himself was clearly an average greek one that is to say of good natural parts of perfectly normal faculties and tastes undisturbed by any originality of character or mind and representing therefore as we may fairly assert the ordinary views and aims of an upright and competent man of the world his description of the gentleman therefore may be taken as a representative account of the recognized ideal of all that class of athenian citizens 
and this is how the gentleman in question Iscomachus describes his course of life in the first place he says i worship the gods next i endeavour to the best of my ability assisted by prayer to get health and strength of body reputation in the city good will among my friends honourable security in battle and an honourable increase of fortune at this point socrates who is supposed to be the interlocutor interrupts do you really covet wealth he asks with all the trouble it involves certainly i do is the reply for it enables me to honour the gods magnificently to help my friends if they are in want and to contribute to the resources of my country here definitely and precisely expressed is the ideal of the athenian gentleman the beautiful body housing the beautiful soul the external aids of fortune friends and the like and the realization of the individual self in public activity upon it follows an account of the way in which Iscomachus was accustomed to pass his days he rises early he tells us to catch his friends before they go out or walks to the city to transact his necessary business if he is not called into town he pays a visit to his farm walking for the sake of exercise and sending on his horse on his arrival he gives directions about the sowing ploughing or whatever it may be and then mounting his horse practises his military exercises finally he returns home on foot running part of the way takes his bath and sits down to a moderate midday meal this combination of physical exercise military training and business arouses the enthusiasm of socrates how right you are he cries and the consequence is that you are as healthy and strong as we see you and one of the best riders and the wealthiest men in the country this little prosaic account of the daily life of an athenian gentleman is completely in harmony with all we have said about the character of the greek ideal but it comprehends only a part and that the least spiritual of that rich and many-sided excellence it may be as well therefore to append by way of compliment the description of another personality exceptional indeed even among the greeks yet one which only greece could have produced the personality of socrates no more striking figure is presented to us in history none has been more vividly portrayed and none in spite of the originality of mind which provoked the hostility of the crowd is more thoroughly hellenic in every aspect physical intellectual and moral that socrates was ugly in countenance was a defect which a greek could not fail to note and his snub nose and big belly are matters of frequent and jocose allusion but apart from these defects his physique it appears was exceptionally good he was sedulous in his attendance at the gymnasia and was noted for his powers of endurance and his courage and skill in war plato records it of him that in a hard winter on campaign 
when the common soldiers were muffling themselves in sheepskins and felt against the cold he alone went about in his ordinary cloak and barefoot over the ice and snow and he further describes his bearing in a retreat from a lost battle how there you might see him just as he is in the streets of athens stalking like a pelican and rolling his eyes calmly contemplating enemies as well as friends and making very intelligible to anybody even from a distance that whoever attacked him would be likely to meet with a stout resistance to this efficiency of body corresponded in accordance with the greek ideal a perfect balance and harmony of soul plato in a fine figure compares him to the wooden statues of silenus which concealed behind a grotesque exterior beautiful golden images of the gods of these divine forms none was fairer in socrates than that typical greek virtue temperance without a touch of asceticism he knew how to be contented with a little his diet he measured strictly with a view to health naturally abstemious he could drink when he chose more than another man but no one had ever seen him drunk his affections were strong and deep but never led him away to seek his own gratification at the cost of those he loved without cutting himself off from any of the pleasures of life a social man and a frequent guest at feasts he preserved without an effort the supremacy of character and mind over the flesh he neither starved nor pampered here is a description by plato of his bearing at the close of an all-night carouse which may stand as a concrete illustration not only of the character of socrates but of the meaning of temperance as it was understood by the greeks aristodemus said that eryximachus phaedrus and others went away he himself fell asleep and as the nights were long took a good rest he was awakened towards daybreak by a crowing of cocks and when he awoke the others were either asleep or had gone away there remained awake only socrates aristophanes and agathon who were drinking out of a large goblet which they passed round and socrates was discoursing to them aristodemus did not hear the beginning of the discourse and he was only half awake but the chief thing which he remembered was socrates compelling the other two to acknowledge that the genius of comedy was the same as that of tragedy and that the true artist in tragedy was an artist in comedy also to this they assented being drowsy and not quite following the argument and first of all aristophanes dropped off then when the day was already dawning agathon socrates when he had laid them to sleep rose to depart aristodemus as his manner was following him at the lyceum he took a bath and passed the day as usual in the evening he retired to rest at his own house with this quality of temperance was combined in socrates a rare measure of independence and moral courage he was never an active politician but as every athenian citizen was called at some time or another to public office 
he found himself on a critical occasion responsible for putting a certain proposition to the vote in the assembly it was a moment of intense excitement a great victory had just been won but the generals who had achieved the success had neglected to recover the corpses of the dead or to save the shipwrecked it was proposed to take a vote of life or death on all the generals collectively socrates as it happened was one of the committee whose duty it was to put the question to the assembly but the proposition was in itself illegal and socrates with some other members of the committee refused to submit it to the vote every kind of pressure was brought to bear upon the recalcitrant officers orators threatened friends besought the mob clamoured and denounced finally all but socrates gave way he alone an old man in office for the first time had the courage to obey his conscience and the law in face of an angry populace crying for blood and as he could stand against a mob so he could stand against a despot at the time when athens was ruled by the thirty tyrants he was ordered with four others to arrest a man whom the authorities wished to put out of the way the man was guilty of no crime and socrates refused i went quietly home he says and no doubt i should have been put to death for it if the government had not shortly after come to an end these however were exceptional episodes in the career of a man who was never a prominent politician the main interest of socrates was intellectual and moral an interest however rather practical than speculative for though he was charged in his indictment with preaching atheism he appears in fact to have concerned himself little or nothing with either theological or physical inquiries he was careful in his observance of all prescribed religious rites and probably accepted the gods as powers of the natural world and authors of human institutions and laws his originality lay not in any purely speculative views but in the pertinacious curiosity practical in its origin and aim with which he attacked and sifted the ethical conceptions of his time what is justice what is piety what is temperance these were the kinds of questions he never tired of raising pointing out contradictions and inconsistencies in current ideas and awakening doubts which if negative in form were positive and fruitful in effect his method in pursuing these inquiries was that of cross-examination in the streets in the market in the gymnasia at meetings grave and gay in season or out of season he raised his points of definition the city was in a ferment around him young men and boys followed and hung on his lips wherever he went by the charm of his personality his gracious courtesy and wit and the large and generous atmosphere of a sympathy always at hand to temper to particular persons the rigours of a generalising logic he drew to himself with a fascination not more of the intellect than of the heart all that was best and brightest in the youth of athens 
his relation to his young disciples was that of a lover and a friend and the stimulus given by his dialectics to their keen and eager minds was supplemented and reinforced by the appeal to their admiration and love of his sweet and virile personality only in ancient athens perhaps could such a character and such conditions have met the sociable outdoor city life the meeting places in the open air and especially the gymnasia frequented by young and old not more for exercise of the body than for recreation of the mind the nimble and versatile athenian wits trained to preternatural acuteness by the debates of the law courts and the assembly all this was exactly the environment fitted to develop and sustain a genius at once so subtle and so humane as that of socrates it is the concrete presentation of this city life that lends so peculiar a charm to the dialogues of plato the spirit of metaphysics puts on the human form and dialectic walks the streets and contends in the palaestra it would be impossible to convey by citation the cumulative effect of this constant reference in plato to a human background but a single excerpt may perhaps help us to realize the conditions under which socrates lived and worked here then is a description of the scene in one of those gymnasia in which he was wont to hold his conversations upon entering we found that the boys had just been sacrificing and this part of the festival was nearly at an end they were all in white array and games at dice were going on among them most of them were in the outer court amusing themselves but some were in a corner of the apoditerium playing at odd and even with a number of dice which they took out of little wicker baskets there was also a circle of lookers-on one of whom was lucis he was standing among the other boys and youths having a crown upon his head like a fair vision and not less worthy of praise for his goodness than for his beauty we left them and went over to the opposite side of the room where finding a quiet place we sat down and then we began to talk this attracted lucis who was constantly turning round to look at us he was evidently wanting to come to us for a time he hesitated and had not the courage to come alone but first of all his friend menexenus came out of the court in the interval of his play and when he saw ctesippus and myself came and sat by us and then lucis seeing him followed and sat down with him and the other boys joined i turned to menexenus and said son of demophon which of you two youths is the elder that is a matter of dispute between us he said and which is the nobler is that a matter of dispute too yes certainly and another disputed point is which is the fairer the two boys laughed i shall not ask which is the richer i said for you two are friends are you not certainly they replied and friends have all things in common so that one of you can be no richer than the other if you say truly that you are friends they assented 
i was about to ask which was the greater of the two and which was the wiser of the two but at this moment menexenus was called away by some one who came and said that the gymnastic master wanted him i supposed that he had to offer sacrifice so he went away and i asked lysis some more questions such were the scenes in which socrates passed his life of his influence it is hardly necessary here to speak at length in the well-known metaphor put into his mouth by plato he was the gadfly of the athenian people to prick intellectual lethargy to force people to think and especially to think about the conceptions with which they supposed themselves to be most familiar those which guided their conduct in private and public affairs justice expediency honesty and the like such was the constant object of his life that he should have made enemies that he should have been misunderstood that he should have been accused of undermining the foundations of morality and religion is natural and intelligible enough and it was on these grounds that he was condemned to death his conduct at his trial was of a piece with the rest of his life the customary arts of the pleader the appeal to the sympathies of the public the introduction into court of weeping wife and children he rejected as unworthy of himself and of his cause his defence was a simple exposition of the character and the aims of his life so far from being a criminal he asserted that he was a benefactor of the athenian people and having after his condemnation to suggest the sentence he thought appropriate he proposed that he should be supported at the public expense as one who had deserved well of his country after his sentence to death having to wait thirty days for its execution he showed no change from his customary cheerfulness passing his time in conversation with his friends so far from regretting his fate he rather congratulated himself that he would escape the decadence that attends upon old age and he had if we may trust plato a fair and confident assurance that a happy life awaited him beyond he died according to the merciful law of athens by drinking hemlock the wisest and justest and best in plato's judgment of all the men that i have ever known we have dwelt thus long on the personality of socrates familiar though it be not only on account of its intrinsic interest but also because it is peculiarly hellenic that sunny and frank intelligence bathed as it were in the open air a gracious blossom springing from the root of physical health that unique and perfect balance of body and soul passion and intellect represent against the brilliant setting of athenian life the highest achievement of the civilization of greece the figure of socrates no doubt has been idealized by plato but it is none the less significant of the trend of hellenic life no other people could have conceived such an ideal no other could have gone so far towards its realization end of chapter three section seven recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey